Well, what a wonderful, wonderful time of the year it is to celebrate the birth of Christ. And I'm so thankful that even this morning it brings such joy to my heart to hear and see our children singing. Isn't that a blessing? I think uh, when I see that and I know the songs that are being reflected from their heart and the words that they're memorizing, it's our prayer that they would stay those lyrics in their hearts and lives for the rest of their, their life and being. And so we're so thankful for that. And it's a blessing to have the children even minister to us. And I welcome you back. And from my family to yours, we desire to say Merry Christmas and may Christ be the focus this day and tomorrow. I mean, the question that I want to ask is last night, we had such a wonderful time, is what is your response to the person of Christ? And then the question to you, and many visitors are probably here, and we're so thankful that you're here, is here's the question, who is Jesus Christ? I mean, obviously, we're celebrating his birth, and I think many in our world today will accept the infant, but not the God-man. They accept him as a baby, but they don't accept him as God in the flesh. I was reading an apologetic work this week on what people have thought about the person of Christ, various people throughout history. Pilate called him, I think we know that, the man with out fault. Diderot, the philosopher, called him the unsurpassed. Napoleon called him the emperor of love. Philosopher Strauss said he's the highest model of religion. John Stuart Mill said he is the guide to humanity. Renan, the French atheist, said that he is the greatest among the sons of men. Theodore Parker called him the youth with God in his heart. Francis Cobb said of Christ that he was the regenerator of humanity. The Dalai Lama says he is the reincarnated uh, Buddhist. In fact, he was reincarnated as Buddha. Nitschke said he's a fable. Uh, Gandhi called him the innocent one. Gorbachev said, of course, he's the first socialist. Th those are, I suppose, nice sentiments. But none of those comes remotely close to a true understanding of who that child and who that child really is. I mean, Christmas often brings us to an identity crisis as to who Jesus really was and is. R.C. Sproul, I think, said it appropriately. There are so many portraits of Jesus in the galleries of the world that it seems hopeless, he said, to clarify the confusion they have wrought in people's minds about who Christ is. He went on to say so many conflicting images, if you will, of him are put forward that some people have despaired of achieving an accurate picture of his true identity. We need Christ. We need a real Christ. A Christ born of empty speculation or created to squeeze into a philosopher's pattern simply won't do. A recycled Christ, a Christ of compromise, he said, can redeem no one. A Christ watered down, stripped of power, debased of glory, reduced to a symbol, or made impotent by scholarly surgery is not Christ, Sproul said, but anti-Christ. I think he's right. I think the need of our day is an accurate representation of the person of Jesus Christ revealed in the word of God. And I want us to look back at one of the clearest Christological passages in all of the Bible. 
open back up to the book of Hebrews, to the book of Hebrews. And I want to look just uh, maybe briefly today, um, not specifically at his incarnation, but more specifically at his deity. I think since the Christmas pageant in December came and uh, we had a wonderful service last night and this service today and a concert with Matt Papa and we celebrate his birth and rightly we should and we've sang about it this morning. But I want to focus here as we began last week, two weeks ago in the book of Hebrews because in chapter one it declares the greatness of Jesus Christ. The greatness of his son. In fact, the purpose of Hebrews in total is to encourage believers to remain faithful to the faith, if you will, to the person of Christ and not fall away. To remain faithful and not drift away. In fact, glance down in chapter 2 in verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. If you will, look over in chapter 3 briefly. It says in 3, chapter 3, verse 7, today if you hear his voice, and that means today, where your fathers put me to test provoke with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart they have not known my ways and then he said look at verse 12 he said take care brothers lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God And so he writes to encourage you, to encourage you about the person and the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's dive into the text in 1-1 and we'll review just for a moment. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. I love that. In these last days, beginning with Christ, he's spoken to us in his son. We noted a couple weeks ago that a wonderful miracle is that God has spoken. We have a God who talks. We have a God who is not distance, a God who is not a wall, a God who is not built into a deist framework. We have a God who speaks, and he speaks there of the prophets who spoke the word of God. But Jesus, as we know, is very God. He is the word of God. The prophets gave a message, but here what he says to begin with is Jesus is the message. God has spoken. He is not silent, praise God. He is not withdrawn. He is not moody. In fact, he's not depressed. He is not old, though there has never been a time when there was not God. There has never been a time when there was not the second person of the Trinity or the Holy Spirit. But he has spoken here, not just in the prophets, but supremely in his son. And really, that's why Hebrews is written. Jesus Christ is greater than everything and everyone. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than the priests that did their work in the Old Testament. He's greater than everyone and everything and greater than every prophet because he's spoken in his son. Now what Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 does is highlight, I'll just say five arguments that display the greatness of his son. The greatness of his son. It is a description of Christ, namely of who he is, in his character, in his essence, and what he has done. 
And I believe if you're taking notes, the thought of the writer here is that here is the why regarding the greatness of God's son. And we looked a couple weeks ago at the first two principles. Number one, that Jesus is the heir of all things. The reason he's so great is he's the heir of all things. It says that in verse two, whom he appointed as heir of all things. The son is the heir of all that God possesses. And so he's great because to no other person, to no other angel, to not Moses or any of the priest, to Jesus Christ, the babe that was born, we looked at that, is the heir of all that God possesses. And I think you would agree, God possesses all things. Well, Jesus Christ, as the son, is the heir of all that he possesses. Secondly, he's not only the heir of all things, Jesus is the creator of the world. Look at verse two at the end, through whom also, it says there that he created the world. Now this is a, maybe, I don't know, humanly, you would think that he's the creator of the world, and then subsequently he's the heir of all things, but here he's the heir of all things, And because he is the creator of the world, I thought the thought here of the writer is Jesus inherits what he himself created. And we looked at John 1. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And then he puts it in a negative form in John 1. Without him was not anything that was made or not was not anything made that was made he made it all colossians 1 16 for by him all things were created in the heaven and the earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things were created through him and for him and so as we celebrate the birth of the baby We do because he took on flesh in his incarnation. But at the same time, the scripture is declaring to us that he is the heir of all things, that he is the creator of all things, that if you will, the baby who was born, hard to fathom, made it all. Not hard to fathom, but it blows our mind. The baby who was born and put in a manger made it all, everything. So he's the heir of all things. He is the creator of all things. It is proof of his deity, but at the same time, he knows your name. He can name all the stars, but he knows you intimately. He knows the very hairs on your head. He knows when you rise up and when you lie down. He knows when there's a word on your tongue before you even speak it. He knows your thoughts. It's amazing to think as we celebrate his birth that Hebrews in this Christological passage declares that he's the heir of all things and the creator of all things, which brings me here to our third point this morning, that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Look at verse three. He is, it's a a marvelous statement, the radiance of the glory of God, and the writer says the exact imprint of his nature. He is the radiance of the glory of God. What what do you mean there? What What does he mean? Jesus radiates, if you will, in his person. He puts light out. He reflects the light, the thought would be, of the glory of God. In other words, we know that you can finish the statement with me that no man can see God and what? Live, but Here, in Christ, who is the light of the world, 
He reveals God to us. And I think I shared with you over the years and briefly last night that in the Old Testament, God's glory, and even when the glory appeared on that mountainside as we have sang this morning, but in the Old Testament, his glory was the visible presence of God among the people. Moses said, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. And so God said, I will go with you and I will be with you. And he sent the pillar of cloud and the fire by night. What is that? It's the glory of God. What is the glory of God? It is a visible manifestation of God. And it was often revealed in a, in a bright light. And that light, at least in the Old Testament, was called Shekinah. And it was a manifestation of the very person of God, or more accurate, accurately to say, that it was a manifestation of God's attributes. In other words, God was revealing himself in his essence, in his being, and he revealed it through the glory of a bright light. Do you remember, of course you do, probably, in Exodus 33, when Moses cried out, I think it's in 33, 18, show me your, what? Glory. He didn't want just the voice. He wanted to see the very essence, the very person of God, the very character of God. Show me who you are. And you remember the next chapter, one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible, in Exodus 34, 1 through 7, God revealed himself to Moses as he put him at, in the, kind of in the cleft of the rock and he let his glory, his radiance, his presence, his person pass by. And then what came out of Exodus 34 is the God who is merciful, the God who is forgiving. And it began to recite the character of God, the attributes of God. And what here the writer is saying is that Jesus is the very radiance, you get it, of the glory of God. That all of God's greatness, all of God's being, all of God's essence shines in the person of Jesus Christ. Maybe some of you have an old translation. I think it used the word instead of radiance that he is the infulgence of God. So God's glory here, his attributes are wonderfully revealed in the sun. I like how it's stated in John 1.14. Remember, the word became what? Flesh. And I love this next phrase, and it dwelt amongst us. The word dwelt is the word for tabernacled amongst us. In other words, the word took on flesh, and he dwelt in his person among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son, what does it say, from the Father. So here in verse 3, he is the radiance, he is the infulgence of the very character of God, the glory of God. And then look at verse 3 again, and the exact imprint of his nature. In other words, he adds to it. What do you mean the exact imprint of his nature? The idea a little bit behind the word is that He's a precise copy of God's being. He's a exact, and then he uses the word imprint. And it was used, was that word, and I, I just, it maybe will allow you to see it. That word imprint was used for an engraving on wood. In other words, when they engraved in the wood, they, they burned it in there, if you will. It was used for a brand that would be, you know, placed into the hide of an animal. 
It was a stamped image that would go onto a coin. It was used of a king's signet ring to close out a piece of communication. And here, he's the radiance of God, the exact imprint, the thought would be, of his nature. Jesus Christ is the very character of God. It says that he is the exact imprint. It's, it's interesting, you don't have to know this, but the Greek word there for exact is the word character. We get obviously our English word character from it. But Jesus Christ, who was born, who lived, is the exact imprint or character of the very essence of God. In other words, when you see Jesus, you see who? God, the invisible God who dwells in unapproachable light is made visible in his son. Now, Jesus is co-equal with the father in nature, but we know that he's distinct in person But in terms of character and nature, he is of the same essence and the same substance as God. This is who was born. This is why we worship him. This is why we give him praise. This is why children give him praise. And if you don't give him praise, the rocks are going to cry out. It's because of who he is. Who is he? He's the heir of all things. He's the creator of the world. He's the very radiance of God, the exact imprint of his nature. In fact, Paul uses a different word, but similar in the book of Colossians. In Colossians 1.15, it says that he, you don't want to miss the language there, is, not was, But as we speak, he is the image of the what? The invisible God. He is, it's a different word, not character, but icon there. E-I-K-O-N, abbreviated or alliterated. He is the image of the invisible God. He is a precise, exact reproduction, if you will, of the character and heartbeat of God. In other words, I could say it a different way that the Lord or that God himself is fully, fully manifest in his son is the thought. The invisible God, whom no one can see, is made visible in Jesus Christ. This is why it says in Colossians 1.19, that in him all the fullness dwells. There's nothing lost in the essence and nature of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, that all the fullness of God dwells in him. This is why the prophet spoke, but he's revealed himself into his son, in in his son in the last days. In the beginning was the word, finish it for me, the word was with God and the word what? Was God. Colossians 2.9, it says there that the fullness of, of deity was pleased to dwell in him. It was all in Christ. One of my favorite scriptures is 2 Corinthians 4, 4, where it speaks of the gospel, the good news, the euangelion of the glory of Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, who is There it is again, the image of God, the icon of God, the exact image of God. 
And then it says in 4.6, God who said light shall shine of the, out of the darkness is the one that has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Again, in Jesus Christ, God himself becomes fully manifest. Do you see why he's better than any prophet? That he's better than any son? That he's better than any angel? That he's better than Moses? That he's better than any high priest? Nobody else could have this said of them, that in Christ God himself becomes manifest. The glory of God, if you will, in human form. He is God, trying to capture this, in visible form. Okay? Sometimes people say, and I don't mean to say this uh, to be funny, but it is, he is God in a bod. God in a body, which is just incredible. Is this not the testimony in John 1.18? Do you remember that there, that no one has ever seen God, the only God, comma, who is at the Father's side, the one who is, he has made him, what, known. In other words, no one can see God, but in the person of Christ, he has made him known, and of course, you know John 14, 9, when Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen who? The Father. Not just like the Father, but the one who has seen me has seen the Father in this sense, that Jesus Christ is the very imprint and stamp of God. What God is in essence what God is in being, the Son is in essence, the Son is in being. So who is that baby that was born? Well, here is the greatness of the Son. He's the heir of all things. He's the creator of the world. He's the radiance of God. But there's a fourth mark of his greatness. It's there in the text that Jesus, in verse 3, is the sustainer of the world. He's the sustainer, number four, of the world. And to do that, look at verse three. It says there, miraculously, majestically, <laughs> incredibly, look. Put your eyes on it in 3B. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Christ not only made all things, will one day inherit all things, but today, as we speak, he is the sustainer of all things. That everything right now in the universe is sustained. And you say, Scott, what do you mean right now? It's put in the present tense. Right now, Jesus Christ is upholding all things by the word of his power. You're sitting, I'm standing, while the world is careening on the axis, spinning so fast that you can sit. How is it held together? It's held together by the sustainer of all things. If you think he's just a man, you're wrong. If you think that he's just a man that brought human virtue, you're wrong. If you're saying he's the, the picture of just man in general, that's wrong. He is the sustainer of all things. And here he uses the word universe by the word of his power. Atheist Stephen Hawking said this, quote, interesting, he said that the eventual goal of science is to provide a single theory that describes the whole universe. In other words, the scientific world, 
never understood what is holding it all together. And what the scientists cannot figure out, the word of God declares that Jesus holds it all together, sustaining the universe as we speak, amen? You say, how does he do that? By the word of his power. So how strong is that word? It's the same thought in Genesis 1. In the beginning was, right, in the beginning was God, and, and it says that God just spoke the world into existence. I mean, if you would just consider this just for a moment. If the earth's rotation, one writer said, slowed down just a little bit, just a little bit, just, if it just slowed down just a little bit, we would either freeze or burn. The sun has a surface temperature of 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. If it were any closer or further, we would ultimately freeze or burn. Our globe is tilted at an exact angle of 23 degrees, which enables us to have four seasons. If it weren't tilted like that, vapors from the ocean uh, would move north and south and pile up monstrous continents of ice. If the moon did not remain on its exact distance from the earth, the ocean tide would inundate the land twice a day. I suppose after the first time it wouldn't matter, right? Twice a day, right? If the ocean floor was merely slipping a few feet deeper than it is, carbon dioxide and the oxygen in the earth's atmosphere would be completely absorbed and no vegetable life would exist on earth. If the atmosphere, our atmosphere out there, did not remain constant but thinned out, then many of the the meteors, which now harmlessly burn up when they hit the atmosphere, would constantly bombard all of us and devastate all of us. How does it stay all together? By Jesus Christ. He is the sustainer of the universe who upholds all things by the word of his power. And it ought to be our response to bow to the king, who's the heir of all things, who's the creator of all things, who's the radiance of God, who's the sustainer of the universe. And look at the fifth and final mark. Though we're on his birth, even over this month, it says at the end of three, after making fascinating that he put this in there right there purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high fathom it he's the heir of all things he's the creator of all things He's the very radiance of the glory of God. He's presently sustaining all the world. But we know, and we'll see that in the book of Hebrews later if you read it, that he made purification for your sins. Is that not humbling? The very one who's the second person of the Trinity, the very one who dwelt in unapproachable light, the very one who had no beginning and no end as the second person of the Trinity took on flesh, came down to this earth, lived a perfect life, and he, that one, made purification for sins. And here as you move in Hebrews in chapter 9, just one verse in 9.12, he he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood securing your eternal redemption. Can you believe that he did that for you? He purified you, took away, if you will, your sins, cast them in the Old Testament as far as the east is from the west, buried them in the remotest part of the sea, and then another writer says, he wiped out your sins like a thick cloud. It says many times in the book of Jeremiah, 
<clears throat> that he will remember your sins no more. Why? Because he's not just a high priest. He's the great high priest. He didn't keep offering himself time and time and time again. And that's why when you see the cross there, he's not on it. Because he died, and when he died, he made purifications for your sins. Then he went into the grave, and then he was glorious, raised on the third day, and he ascended into glory and appeared to over 500 people at one time. So his redeeming work is done. And then look at it again in verse 3. And when it was done, here's the... the, the the finish of it. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Why? I think you know. His work was finished. The priest work was in the Old Testament was never done. Time and time again, they would go in and offer sacrifice after sacrifice, which could never take away the fullness of sin. So they had to be in that temple, be on their duty, uh, you know, give the sacrifice on the day of the atonement, give the, sa- it would forgive them and give them a cleansing for that moment. But then they needed to rinse, if you will, and repeat. But Jesus, once as he offered himself, sat down at the right hand. What is that? It's the place of power. It's the place of, so- of authority. Certainly in one sense, Jesus has always been the king, but he was also made king when he fulfilled that priestly role by the sacrifice of our sin. At least he he was the great high priest, we would say. It says in Hebrews 10, when Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins in 1012, he sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews 8.1 says the point in that we are saying is this. Here the writer gets super clear. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne on majesty in heaven. It's wonderful. Say, so, well, why did, he, why did he do that though? I mean, we, we know he's the heir of all things. He's the creator of all things. He's the radiance of God. He's the sustainer of the very world that we are in right now. But for what purpose? If you have your Bible in your hand, look over at Hebrews chapter 2. Let me just remind you of this. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says in verse 17, Therefore, I like this phrase. He had to. You can stop there just for a second. This wasn't an option for you, for me. He had to be made like his brothers. In what sense? In every respect. He took on flesh. Why? So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. It's Christ. You don't need to go confess your sins to a priest. You have a great priest, a great high priest who's merciful. He's faithful. He's called the high priest and the servants of God. What did he do? He made propitiation for the sins of the people. Amen? It's not the only reason he took on flesh. You say, can you give another one? Yes, just look at the next verse. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, not only does he die for sins, but he is able to help those who are being tempted. How does he help? Well, because he was tempted in all things and yet without what? Sins, he can help you. That he not only died in your place, but he can help and assist you through the greatest temptations, through the greatest trials that you will ever face in your life. And he knows, and he's able, he has the power to help those who are being tempted. So beloved, here's five arguments 
that display the greatness of Jesus Christ over every rival. Of, over every rival. It's the heir of all things, the creator of all things, the radiance of God, the sustainer of the world. And here, he's the substitute for your sin. Don't miss the Christmas season. Amen? It's all about Christ. Don't reject him. What are you saying, Scott? Today... If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If you've been holding out on the person of Christ, I just present the beauty and the glory and the majesty and the power of Jesus Christ. You say, what must be done? Well, you must repent of your sins and you must believe in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him by faith. In fact, I present the greatness of Christ to you that you might come to know him. That Paul said in Colossians 1.18 that he might have the preeminence of all things in your life. Do you know him? This is who he is. And I think the only proper response is to bow our knee in love and adoration towards him that he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. And when you've seen him, you've seen the father. There is a great song I listened to it this morning. I won't give you all of the stanza because I've probably said it before, but I worship with it every Christmas. It's a song by Mark Lowry. You've heard it before. It's probably some years back now, but you remember the refrain. It's Mary, did you know? And here's just one of the stanzas. Mary, did you know? that your baby boy is Lord of all creation. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Mary, did you know that your baby boy was heaven's perfect lamb and the sleeping child you're holding is the great I am? That's who Christ is. May it be that it's correct in your thinking and mine, the heart of your children and grandchildren, so that we don't have an improper view of him, but a right one. Would you bow your head with me?